Coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We talk with NCBA's CEO and get his thoughts on the continuing importance of sustainability for the entire beef industry. Plus, see how Zoetis is spotlighting the important relationship between beef producers and their animals. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kate Maher. Last month, the USDA released findings from the 2022 Ag Census, a once every five year survey that offers a look at the current state of American agriculture. This data is used by policymakers to help determine funding for a range of programs, and it also highlights some of the needs of farmers and ranchers across the country. The census found that U.S. farms and ranches produced $543 billion in agricultural products, up from $389 billion in 2017. Also, 95% of U.S. farms are family owned, and there was an 11% increase in the number of young farmers with 10 or fewer years of experience. However, the census also shows that the U.S. lost nearly 142,000 farms from 2017 to 2022 and more than 20 million acres of farmland. Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack says that's a concerning trend, and he hopes the loss of both farms and acreage serves as a wake-up call to Congress. Are we okay with losing that much farmland? Or is there a better way? That's the importance of this survey. It allows us to take a snapshot in time allows us to compare what has occurred over the five-year period and begin to ask ourselves questions about the policy formation and the direction that we need to take in order to correct or deal with some of the challenges that the data presents. Improving economic and environmental stewardship is one way to help reverse the trend of loss of farms and ranches. We asked cattle producers to share some of the stewardship and conservation practices they're already using on their own operations. Environmental stewardship is very important in our operation. We use it in our grazing management systems and in our feedlot and our crop and our crop production systems too, you know, no-till, cover crops, hugely important. We do a lot of rotational grazing, a lot of forestry practices. Uh, we're having problems in our area right now with the black vultures coming all the way up to Missouri, so uh, we, are, we are in contact with conservation on how to dispose of those correctly. So there, there's a lot of aspects that, that come into play there. We implement a number of conservation practices. We've for a long time had very controlled grazing. Uh, we, we practice uh, rotational grazing. We, we're conscious of, of the time and season of the year and how long we, we are in our pastures. We uh, install in, uh, many, many miles of pipeline to benefit the, the distribution of the cattle across our range. As a mother and as a producer, I fully understand that we don't own the land, we're borrowing it from our children. So on our operation, every day we are trying to make conscious decisions that are gonna ensure the sustainability of our operation, not just on home place, but as a state as a whole. And that's why we're a member of NCBA and ANCW, is to be able to learn those conservation efforts, study them, take them back, use them. Sustainability also took center stage at CattleCon in Orlando. Cattlemen to Cattlemen reporter Megan Grebner caught up to NCBA CEO Colin Woodall to get his thoughts on why this topic is a priority for the entire beef industry. We're with Colin Woodall following the Sustainability Forum sponsored by Elanco. Colin, today in this forum, what did you hear that maybe assured you that cattle producers are on the right track when it comes to sustainability? I think the good news is sustainability, as we talked about today, really is doing more of what we have been doing for years. We as an industry are all about continual improvement, making sure that we get better and we can make the most of these 
great cattle that we have and also to make sure we're making the most of the rangeland. And what we heard from our panelists today is that we have tools that are in our toolbox today to help us with that, more tools coming down the pike, and also collaboration between the cow-calf operators, the backgrounders, the stalkers, and the feeders in making sure that we have a holistic approach throughout the entire beef supply chain to showcase the great work that we are doing to be good stewards of the land and our cattle. What are some of the concerns or how can uh, producers maybe um, counteract some of the activist messages that may be hindering uh, the communication and the progress on sustainability? This is about really telling our own story, and that's the, probably the most effective tool that we have. And we saw that from Gary Price, who was one of our panelists, a producer from Texas, and he has done a great job of inviting people to his operation. He's made it clear that they're not closing gates, they're opening gates, and they're bringing in anybody who wants to come see what they have done in taking out invasives and putting back the range to the way it was with native grasses and really showcasing that story. And that's having a big impact on how successful he is as an operator and also sharing that story. So really the message is to producers, we don't have anything to be afraid of because our story is the best story out there. And what we find is when you open up and you tell people, it's really hard for them to throw rocks back at you once they've actually seen the hard work that you have done to protect that grass and to protect those animals. Colin, what's the biggest opportunity for producers in the sustainability conversation? You know, the biggest thing is really looking at production technology. What kind of tools do we have today? What kind of tools do we need in the future to be as effective and efficient as possible? And that's where NCBA works with our members to not only help identify where those tools can come, but work with our partner companies like Elanco, who is the sponsor of this forum, to be able to get the regulatory approvals in place so that way we can get those new tools to market as quickly as possible and to reassure the consumer that these are tools that are helping us be more efficient to make sure that there's going to be plenty of beef and they're not tools that they need to be afraid of. Colin, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Megan. To follow along on what NCBA is doing on this issue and others, go to the website beef.org. I'm Megan Grebner, Brownfield Ag News for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Still ahead on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll tell you about a great new video series from Zoetis that highlights how cattle producing families are transitioning their operations from one generation to the next. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Our thoughts and prayers are with cattle producers across the country being impacted by natural disasters, including wildfires. Information on disaster relief and a list of organizations where you can provide donations can be found at ncba.org. Handle feed, waste, and other materials on your operation with John Deere equipment. Weigh feed on the go with dynamic weighing. And move materials faster without spilling with the level to horizon feature on 6R tractors. Move and stack bales easily and clean up brush and debris with improved grapple work on 5 Series tractors. Get into tight spaces with skid steers and wheel loaders and check calves, fences, and more with John Deere Gators. Ask your John Deere dealer to learn more. That certain time in the day when you can take a deep breath knowing your work is done. That's the feeling Aspen products can create cost-effective alternatives to name brands that deliver the same results. Quillaxin is one of them. Use it to prevent and treat respiratory disease in your herd. Then breathe easy. Find them at Animal Health International. American agriculture is made up of millions of operations that are family-based. And today I'm with Zoetis, an organization that is celebrating that bond that goes on for generations. With me today, Clint Mefford, the head of communications for Zoetis. Clint, tell us just a little bit about this campaign you started this last fall called Born of the Bond. Why did you start that campaign? Right, so it was important for Zoetis to tell the story of producers, our beef producers in the United States and especially a story about transitional farming, right? It's something that all of our customers are facing all over the country. And for us to focus on one family and share their story of community, cattle and well-being, um, and just to celebrate this way of life was really important to us. 
And I have to say, you picked quite a family. Tell us a little bit about why you chose the Schuler family for this first episode. Well, first off, they're great advocates for the beef industry. They are innovative. They've been in this for decades. But at the same time, they're going through a transition. So David, of course, who we'll hear from, is going through that with his family currently. But him and his wife are great supporters of their community. They're involved. And at the same time, they are in an amazing place in this country, in the sand hills of Nebraska, right? One of the best stories that we have in the cattle industry for sustainability is the sand hills of Nebraska. And David Schuler, you come to us from Schuler Red Angus of Bridgeport, Nebraska. Tell us a little bit about what it felt like to be selected to serve as a spokesperson. Yeah, when Zoetis came to us with this opportunity, uh, we had to jump at it. And I don't think we quite knew what we were getting ourselves into when they uh, came to the ranch with their SUVs and, and company crew. And uh, it was just a special moment to be able to share the story. I say the best days of ranching are when we get to share our story. And I, I appreciate being able to do that. And Zoetis put together such an incredible uh, episode series with it. And I, I don't think we have a very unique story. I think it's happening across the nation in this transitional period. And I enjoy the challenges I had and looking back now and what we have to go in the future. Uh, I think it's, it's something that we're all gonna have to, to see in our futures in family farms and ranches. One of the things that really struck me about what I saw was uh, your dad made a comment. You, he always wanted you to come back, but he said it had to be his decision. How did you make that decision to come back to the home ranch? Yeah, I was, I was blessed in college to have an opportunity to, for one, have an opportunity to go to college and two, have the opportunity to come back to the operation after that full time. And I have to thank my grandparents, my parents for that. And they had, I had to think hard about the opportunities that college led me with, with, uh, with careers, corporate, my friends that I made there that, I, that to this day have, has built me. But I brought all that back to the operation. I had to choose 100% one or the other. And when I chose 100% to come back to the ranch, it was, it was a, a hard time, a stressful time of what that looks like. I know that I'm not the only one seeing that happen, but when uh, now that I'm four or five years down the road, I know I made the right decision and uh, I get to bask in the, the, the flowers of that. Yeah, and you said it right. I think there are a lot of people like you who are trying to make that decision. And similarly, a lot of families trying to figure out how they're going to incorporate the next generation in and make it all work financially. Uh, and as a friend of mine, the Browns say, keep the family and the ranch and the ranch and the family. What advice would you give other folks in your shoes who might be considering coming back as a next generation? I'd say the first step is to write down intent. And that could be on the back of a napkin all the way to a contract. But the intent has to be there before anything. So you know where everyone would stand in the family, whether that's siblings, parents, grandparents, uh, maybe even your hired hands, what, what we see the future is. And now we, know, we have something to start our conversations with. And we have those conversations now that helps so much more than having to have it at a time that's not quite as a, of a likely time to have it. And we hope to have it done before those moments happen. That's great advice. Thank you both. And if you want to learn more and see more from the Born to the Bond series, go to borntothebond.com. When we come back, you'll get a chance to see more of the Schuler family story. Stay with us. Cattle producers across the country work hard to care for their animals and their land. The USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service is there to help. Find out how you can work with NRCS to develop a conservation plan for your operation. Find possible funding resources for implementing conservation practices or get free expert advice on ways to improve your farm or ranch. Visit the website nrcs.usda.gov today. Weeds will rob me of my investments. The weeds are not palatable to cows. They will not eat them. Or if they do eat them, some of them may be toxic. So there's a return on investment by allowing there to be more grass available to be grazed by the cattle. Follow one family's journey to pass down their ranch and their way of life at bornofthebond.com. A video series and true story brought to you by Zoetis. Here in the Midwest states of America, there's a huge line right by Lincoln, Omaha, all the way up to Canada, down to Louisiana. Anything west of there, it spaces out drastically. There's not very many people within 20 miles of your nearest neighbor. A nearest neighbor that's your age, you're looking pretty hard to find. Uh, 
don't know if you can always explain what love is, but you end up loving the ranch. It's always wonderful when it rains in the spring, and it's always wonderful when the snow melts. The challenges of moving on with your ranch and knowing when that date comes when it may not be viable economically or with your family to continue ranching. All around us, everywhere, these examples of the kids not wanting to come back to the operation and they go down their own path in America. The Schulers have been here for the last 75 years on this ranch. Two generations preceded me who purchased this ranch in 1947. I was fortunate to, to grow up on the ranch and be a part of that my whole life. This ranch was originally homesteaded by a man named Guy Lang. He was from New York State. He came out here with his wife and his brother. They settled here and built a log home in the 1870s. They chose this natural windbreak of the Buttes and they allowed this area to be kind of like this little natural oasis for good grass by the creek. David is my son. He grew up here on the ranch. Growing up, I told my mom that, well, I can ranch on the weekdays, and then on Sunday, I'll just go play quarterback for the Broncos. And that was just a, a normal thought of mine until I saw how much work they do. He had other opportunities coming out of school, obviously. A very capable young man. Those two opportunities in college to go either to the big city and, and take a job somewhere else or moving home, there's no in-between. My senior year in college, when the avenues and the doors started getting closer and closer and closer to me of need to pick one and shut the other, I was probably more stressed than I should have been. I think he had to wrestle with that decision on his own. It had to be his decision. And that was a stressful time for my family and me and my parents. That's a challenge to all of us that are ranchers to figure out the destiny of our ranching operations. When a business is generational like that, it's hard because if it fails, you've got a legacy that's failed. You know, you're affecting jobs for multiple generations. If you're a rancher, you end up with a real connection to the ranch. And if you can't take care of it, you may decide that's a personal failure. I had to make some serious decisions coming home or taking that opportunity. And I didn't know what I was getting myself into until that day. I just said it aloud, that you're going home. I put my cowboy boots on, put my cowboy hat on, and I was gonna become a rancher. That would have been my parents' goals all along, is for some generation of the Schulers to take that over so the ranch could continue. I lived in a fraternity house with 75 guys for four years to living alone in my house <laughs> immediately after college. So that was a huge, huge change for me and my mental health. My coworkers were my parents. The bickering happens, the challenges happen of working hand in hand with each other. You're always around them. If a person can come back to the ranch right after college and work with your parents every day, that's the hardest transition. At the end of the day, we still have lunch. At the end of the day, we still have dinners together. And that won't stop. I'm very fortunate with David you know, when is he ready to take over the ranch? I mean, he's, he's ready now. But I will always be ready to help him. I hope I could do that for a long time. As long as I can. Next up on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we've got a look at a company that can make your life easier with their hydraulic portable corrals on wheels. That story is straight ahead. We'll be right back. Our cattle don't take any days off. They need food and water every day. There's been generations now taking care of this line of genetics. And it only takes one big screw up for that to go away. And that heavy burden is something that every cattleman feels. Otherwise, all that work that my grandparents did, my great-grandparents did, my parents have done, can come to an end. 
Are you concerned about the impact government policies could have on your cattle business? One way to make your voice heard in Washington is by joining NCBA. When you join, you'll be part of the nation's oldest and largest national cattle industry organization that has a professional team working in Washington, D.C. on issues that matter to cattle producing families nationwide. Don't stay on the sidelines. Make your voice heard by joining NCBA today at the website ncba.org. you have an upcoming production sale to advertise, then contact the Cattlemen to Cattlemen marketing team or your breed association to learn more. Well, for cattle producers, maximizing efficiency is very important to their operation. And one way they can do exactly that is by utilizing proper cattle handling equipment. And joining us from Rawhide Portable Corrals is Heather Dallas. And Heather, you're the daughter of John McDonald, the founder of Rawhide Portable Corrals. And, and truly, for over 22 years now, you guys have been innovators in this area, helping ranchers across this great country of ours maximize efficiency, get the right cattle handling equipment on their farms and ranches. And, and this year is nothing different. Give us some, some of the details about what's new with with you guys. Sure. So yes, for 22 years, my dad has been the innovator and it's been really cool for us to watch as his kids all the years. If he sees a problem, he fixes it. Through all these 22 years, we continue to make new changes, new changes. And this year, we have a new patented change that we're very excited about. He has added a torsion axle suspension system to our corrals. And so now, not only will it make it the ride smoother for you as the driver, but it's gonna make it easier on your corral as well as easier on that really expensive vehicle that you're driving it with. So, you know, we wanna protect you and your vehicle and it's also gonna come with brakes. And so that's, we've got that as one of our new patents. And then we also have a racking system that was patent pending and we found out today it's officially patented. So it's an exciting week for Rawhide. Absolutely. Yes. Well, congratulations Thank on you. that. But, you know, just taking it a step further, I mean, when we talk about portable corral systems, I mean, how important is it or how cool is it, let me put it that way, for these ranchers to be able to take something like this from Rawhide Portable Corrals, uh, take the system itself yeah. to where the cattle is at versus vice versa. Oh, it's easier, but it saves so much time. The efficiency, when we were kids, you know, it was a process, even a two day process. You gotta take your panels, you're gonna set things up, you gotta take your horses, catch your cows, take them home, bring them back. Now it's all in one thing. You take your corral, you do it all in one place, you go home. And we have one of our customers online, he posted that the two times his wife has been the most mad at him. The first time was when he came home with the corral, second time for not buying it sooner. So, I mean, it's a game changer. Yeah, well, that's a win for him, for it's sure. It's a win you for know, everybody. At the end of the day, it's a win for him and for everybody. You're right. For everybody. You know, as we talk about Rawhide Portable Corrals, I mean, I think it's really important that we know that you guys truly are a family-run yeah. business out of Abilene, Kansas. Yes. Tell us more. Oh, it's exciting. So when Rawhide first started, we joked, we were all in high school and junior high, so my dad did it out of necessity because his manual labor was going. But um, no, so it was just my dad. He was by himself. He was building them, going to farm shows, doing the sales calls. And you know, Rawhide went through a lot in those early phases and my mom joined the team. And when my mom joined, you know, they continued to grow and eventually my brother joined in sales. My sister's been there for 10 years. She helps run the office, she does all the business stuff. And then now in September, I joined the team. Um, I've been a nurse practitioner for 11 years and I actually stepped away because I feel so passionately about this business and about my family and I wanna do everything I can to help them and also to help other people know 
you know, who we are at Rawhide, what we represent, and how awesome this product is. Everyone should have one. Well, they should, and you're doing an amazing job, and it might just be the Thank right you. medicine you needed to keep your sanity. That's right, and, that's uh, let, right. Let's kind of wrap things up by just explaining, you know, some of the different models sure. you guys have. Sure, So we have three different models that all come in three different sizes, and our most popular model that most people refer back to is the processor. That is what we have behind us right here. It was my dad eventually kind of added this in and it has the permanent hydraulic alley, the permanent transport wheels. It's all hydraulic. We've now added that torsion to it. You can get it with a loading chute, you can add a head gate and it really can do everything for you. The other model we have is the classic and that is a throwback to his original design. Um, it still has the same capacity as our processor but it does not have the permanent alley. It has a temporary alley that can be formed in two sizes, a size for calves and a size for cows. Um, it's a more affordable option. You do have to remove the transport wheels, but it's a great corral still, and we still sell a lot of those. And then a couple years ago, he invented the Rancho Deluxe, and it is our largest corral. It can hold up to 600 head, steer weight, and you can form four pens for sorting, and it's a really good catch pen. It doesn't have an alley at this time. We're working on that. It's got dual wheels because it's heavier. Um, but it's a great corral for people who just need to catch a lot of cattle. And so we, have, we feel like we have a corral for everybody's needs. And, you know, give us a call. We would love to help people figure out which one is right for them. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we appreciate your time. Yes, but that is you. all the time that we have. But yeah. the good news is if you want to learn more about everything and even some more that we have talked about today, you can jump online and visit rawhideportablecorral.com. Well, that wraps up this edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thanks so much for spending time with us. We'll see you again next week, right here on RFD TV.